Okay, well, I'm delighted to be here, um, and uh, what a great act to follow. Um, I have been asked to speak about IP exhaustion and parallel trade. Now, make no mistake, if there were strong feelings expressed about the last subject, there are equally strong feelings to be expressed about this subject. On the one hand, we have the rights owners who are protecting their rights, and on the other hand, we have the free and fair competition interests. And the other topic that I was asked to touch upon is Brexit. And, of course, that has stirred up all these emotions all over again and has given the UK an opportunity to say what sort of exhaustion regime it wants and where the balance lies between those two interests. So, a brief recap. I'm talking about the sale of genuine goods and the point at which the IP rights holders' control over protected goods expires. Um, we need to talk about a little bit more competition law, but um, before I do that, I wanted to say that there are basically two theories in relation to exhaustion. Well, first one is not exhaustion at all. It's an implied licence, and that is, uh, goes back to an old UK case of Betts and Wilmot, uh, which was a 19th century case, where the judge said that, the, trans that uh, the goods are transferred with the license to use them, and that when a man has purchased an article, he expects to have the control of it. And there must be some clear and explicit arrangement, uh, agreement sorry, to the contrary to justify the vendor in saying that he has not given the purchaser that control. So that was one theory. The other theory is this exhaustion theory. So that when you put a a goods, the goods onto the market, the IP rights in them have been exhausted. In other words, they have been extinguished. They are no longer there, so they cannot be asserted. There is nothing left uh, to assert. Uh, and the um, rationale behind that is that otherwise um, the IP rights will stick Remora-like uh, to uh, the goods as they flow through ma the markets. Now, that expression comes from a US case of Lexmark. Uh, and um, I don't know, I had to look up what a Remora was. That's one of those blood-sucking fishes that you see on the undersides of the giant manta rays and whales, and they're hanging on. And that's what the judge in that case thought of, of the IP rights hanging on to the product, product and stopping the free flow of that product through the market. So two th different theories. Um, and then exhaustion comes in a number of different flavours. Um, you can have national exhaustion of rights, uh, where you put your product on the market in the country uh, and that exhausts the rights only in that particular country. And then some countries have a theory of international exhaustion. So if the goods are put on the market anywhere in the world, the IP rights um, are exhausted. Well, the former of those, the national exhaustion, was a little bit of a problem when it came to the European common market. Uh, and the uh, ECJ, as it then was, quickly woke up to the fact that national intellectual property rights could stop the free movement of goods. Uh, and so they put a stop to that using Article uh, 34, as it now is, uh, to uh, say that the goods are exhausted on a regional basis for the whole of what was then the community, then the EU, and now the EEA. Um, and uh, Article 36 places some limits on that, uh, but uh, it is construed extremely narrowly. Um, now, the UK uh, has um, adopted into national law uh, various, the, these principles on exhaustion, uh, and I've just set out in this slide uh, the provisions in the Trademarks Act, which comes from the Directive and the Copyright Designs and Patents Act and the Registered Designs Act. I'm going to take as my uh, example for looking into this in more detail uh, the trademark law. Uh, these two provisions in Section 12 mirror Article 7 of the Directive uh, and then again uh, Articles 34 and 36 of the TFEU. 
The first one is the basic rule, that once the goods are put on the market uh, with uh, the consent of uh, the uh, uh, either by the proprietor or with his consent, then they are exhausted. The first challenge uh, to that basic rule was though uh, came up uh, in oh dear this is uh, gone in the wrong order but came up in a case of silhouette and the question there was having taken uh, this law into uh, the the principles under the TFEU into our national law had that in any way changed the law in relation to international exhaustion so those countries that had a principle of international exhaustion was that changed and the answer was yes in a series of three cases it was yes yes and yes uh, we when we said yes we meant yes um, and um, the uh, first case was this silhouette case uh, which was all to do with old stocks of fashion spectacles which were being moved from Bulgaria into Austria before Bulgaria joined the uh, European uh, com community. Um, and uh, the question was uh, whether they could be stopped uh, as they came uh, into Austria. Uh, and the answer was yes, because Article 7 does not leave open to member states the option of providing for international exhaustion. And that was repeated in this Sebago uh, case all about the dockside shoes. Um, what the parallel importers tried to say there was because uh, identical goods were already on the mar market, uh, the rights have been exhausted. Uh, and the ECJ said, no, that's not correct. Exhaustion only applies in relation to each item. And then there were a couple of uh, referrals which were joined, uh, the uh, Davidoff and the uh, Levi Jeans case from the UK, uh, where, uh, again, this question came up. Um, and what the ECJ said in that case was, when looking at consent um, as to um, whether you have consented to the goods being imported into the EU or not, it's effectively, you've got to prove there, have, there has been express consent on the behalf of the rights owner because they are effectively giving up the right to stop the goods coming over the border into the EU. And that, those rules also apply to other harmonised rights uh, in relation to the distribution right and uh, copyright. Uh, the Advocate General said in the Laser Discan case uh, that he sees no reason not to interpret those provisions in exactly the same way as the trademark rules. So for harmonised rights, uh, we've got um, a harmonised um, set of rules uh, for when exhaustion occurs. Now, I'm going to look at the exception to that. When is it legitimate for the proprietor to oppose further dealings in the goods? And this particular provision has really been tested to destruction by the pharmaceutical uh, community um, uh, because, of course, uh, there, there are so many issues uh, arising uh, in relation to pharmaceuticals. And some of the questions that have been asked is, well, um, because of different um, regulatory requirements in different countries, uh, goods are sold in different quantities in different countries. So can I take uh, goods uh, purchased in one country um, and repackage them, take them all to bits and repackage them to be able to sell them uh, in another country? Um, and if I am doing that and there's one trademark applied in one country and another trademark uh, in the country of importation, can I put the trademark, um, can I change the trademark and put the trademark uh, of the country of importation onto the packaging? Um, and the answer in both those cases has effectively been yes, provided that uh, you comply with what are called the BMS requirements. So in other words, you can rebox and you can rebrand uh, the products provided they comply with these five requirements. 
In other words, you've got to show that it is necessary to repackage uh, the product to be able to access the second market, the market of the country of importation, that there is no effect on the original condition of the product, there's a clear identification of the manufacturer and importer, uh, the presentation isn't damaging to the trademark, uh, and notice has been given to the trademark proprietor, and that effectively, as uh, Robin Jacob uh, explained, was because... Um, Reaffixing a trademark, rebranding a product, uh, does have the capacity to jeopardise the reputation uh, of the trademark, uh, but in these circumstances there is an exception if you comply with the BMS criteria. And just to show you how this works in practice, I'm going to take a more recent case um, of SEP, or Speciality European Pharma, against Doncaster, um, and in that case, um, the judge was saying, well, the principles by now, and uh, this was in 2015, uh, are pretty clear. But it's just applying those principles that was obviously difficult in this case. What was happening is that Doncaster was importing into the UK a French product called Keris, which was a 20 milligram um, trose trospium chloride product um, and they were also importing into the UK a German product, the same product called Urivesk and they were renaming it uh, Regurin um, and at first instance um, Asplin said that um, they could not do that because it was not objectively necessary to have access to the market uh, because they could still have access to a large generic market under the generic name uh, Trospium Chloride. So she held that uh, the trademark uh, was infringed. In the Court of Appeal, they overturned that uh, and said, um, well, no, that's not correct, um, because... Um, Unless the, uh, Doncaster rebranded the product, they could not have access uh, to the branded market. Uh, and they said that doctors uh, are likely to um, use the name Regurin when they're writing out the prescription. And the pharmacist is not, in those instances, allowed to swap in the generic product. And so Doncaster is losing out in supplying product that can uh, be, uh, fulfill that prescription. So you can see how uh, uh, you know, these rules have been applied again and again and again uh, against uh, the trademark owner. Now, what about uh, debranding? Uh, well, you would have thought that if you took the trademark off the product altogether... Uh, there would be nothing to complain about. There would be nothing that infringed the trademark owner's trademark because you've taken the trademark off the product all the, uh, altogether. Well, you'd be wrong. Uh, and this is the CJEU case that says you're wrong. Um, this was all about the importation of forklift trucks uh, and Duma was taking off the Mitsubishi mark uh, and that was held nevertheless to be... Uh, uh, an infringement because it derived the trademark owner of the benefit of the essential right and affected the function of the trademark. So effectively, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So <laughs> um, how the, now, those are the rules as we presently have them. Moving on to Brexit. Uh, now we have left the EU and we are in the transition period. Um, what are we going to do about all these rules? Um, the withdrawal agreement doesn't really help us. All it says in the withdrawal agreement is that if a good has been put on the market and is exhausted on the date of uh, exit, uh, then it remains exhausted. So is this really an opportunity for the UK um, to reconsider its rules on exhaustion? Well, the UK asked, the um, government asked Ernst & Young to do a study on the exhaustion of intellectual property rights to help it answer this question. Um, 
they asked uh, um, as young to ask the community about national, international, and regional exhaustion. Uh, the conclusion was, however, uh, that it was a fundamentally difficult question. Uh, no, no, no prizes there. Um, and that they couldn't quantify it in any market except the pharma sector. And they weren't going to come up with any suggestions or recommendations, but they did note that most people wanted uh, to retain the status quo. Um, and I plucked out of the report some of the figures that they mentioned, which are, uh, you know, just shows the size of the market here. Parallel trade in the EEA of approximately five billion uh, pounds, um, and in the UK of one billion. Um, actually, I have to stick on that slide. Um, you, they, they did go through some of the arguments, um, and I thought it would be useful, actually, to collect them here to show you why this is such a, a, a hard-fought fight between uh, the pharma companies and the parallel importers. Pharma companies point out that prices are controlled and vary across the EU between about 20 and 50%, which allows arbitrages to make a profit of something between 10 and 15%, uh, just moving goods from one country to another country. That means that money is being taken away from them, which they might invest in um, R&D. It encourages them not to supply to poorer countries, uh, which might pay less for the goods, uh, and so increasing the sums of money that can be made by these arbitrages. And it impacts the safety of the products because it makes it more difficult to tell whether you've got a genuine parallel imported product or a counterfeit. On the other hand, the arguments are all about competition and consumer access. The parallel importers argue that it decreases pressures on national health budgets, and we can see here that the NHS is saving approximately £100 million pounds per annum um, through uh, the purchase of parallel imported uh, products. And they point out that the only competition for impatent pharmaceuticals comes from parallel imported products, uh, which drives down prices down, they estimate, by about 3%. On Brexit, of course, pharma is very, very against international exhaustion and pro either regional or national exhaustion. And the parallel importers, of course, want lots of international exhaustion. Uh, and they point out that if you suddenly went to a national um, uh, exhaustion, uh, that would cause drug shortages uh, and over the long term would, of course, increase prices. Well, um, what the government has in place at the moment is something which uh, would apply in the event of a hard Brexit, and the aim is to preserve the status quo as much as possible. Uh, this is this Intellectual Property Exhaustion of Rights, um, SI, um, and I've put up here the amendment that is, is made to the Trademarks Act. Uh, they've slipped in the words and uh, the, the UK, so that there's exhaustion in the UK and the EEA. Uh, but, of course, they can't do anything in relation to what uh, the EU is doing in relation to uh, uh, countries uh, that are now outside the EU. The UK has thrown itself outside Fortress Europe. And so, effectively, what this does is give you an asymmetric exhaustion regime. Holders of IP rights in the EU can stop products coming across from the UK into continental Europe. Um, and the patent provision, more complicatedly worded, but has the same effect. The government's advice on this, uh, they, they do recognise this, is go and talk to your lawyer. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, uh, and just before you think, well, you know, we're a rich country, um, goods are never exported from the UK to Europe, well, think again. There was this case of uh, all about the export from the UK to Spain of Schweppes tonic water, uh, which in that case the EU said was okay because the two companies, there had been a split in the trademark ownership, 
uh, that the two companies were coordinating to promote the global trademark image. Uh, but that sort of uh, import, import into Spain now would be stopped under uh, because of Brexit. Uh, the big question remains, what about goods imported from third countries? Well, under the SI, the SI is effectively silent about it, but under the European, uh, the European Union Withdrawal Act, it's quite clear that uh, Silhouette and Laserdisc and are intended to be retained EU case law. So effectively, we are retaining this sort of fortress Europe uh, uh, um, provision. Um, and so, sorry, no, we, we are uh, retaining uh, the fact that um, uh, we no longer uh, recognize international uh, exhaustion of rights. Um, and that is until the Supreme Court or a relevant court or parliament decides otherwise. As I've said all along, patents are slightly different. Uh, the principle of implied license still relates to internationally, uh, in that international sales of goods. And so uh, the principles in Betts and Wilmot still apply to patents. I put here on the slide, if I'm wrong, uh, in relation to silhouette and laser disc and being retained case law. Uh, well, that is because uh, there's a provision uh, in the European Union Withdrawal Act about uh, the law being modified um, and uh, whether this retained case law is still applicable, and those questions have been raised. Um, I believe that actually relates to the law being modified in Europe, and so I think silhouette and laser disc do apply uh, until uh, we come to some change. But what of the future? Well, as I said, the government is consulting, but it can't force the European Union to reciprocate, so we can't have the old system as it used to be. So should we keep this asymmetric system that we've now got under, this, under the SI, or should we tear it up and go either to national or international exhaustion? Well, the SI scheme has been uh, criticised uh, because some say it's not consistent with the WTO rules and TRIPS. I think there's also another problem with it in relation to the fact that uh, we will have, uh, a, we will adopt the EU case law, uh, but we won't be subject to the rules of the CJEU. So the law might change in Europe, but we're stuck with an sort of older version of it. Um, so should we move? Well, I'm not really going to answer that. I did, I've sat on the fence for ages. I mean, I'm, I suppose uh, I mostly believe in um, free movement of goods, um, and therefore I would uh, be in favour of international exhaustion, but I think the pharma industry is different, and some of those arguments that they do raise, uh, the humanitarian arguments in relation to moving drugs from poorer countries to rich countries, uh, do uh, our powerful ones. I suppose the only point to add is that in Switzerland, they've been grappling with these issues before we have had to grapple with them. Um, they have an international uh, exhaustion in relation to trademarks and to copyrights. But uh, some years ago, they changed their regime in relation to patents. So they have a regional exhaustion, EEA-wide exhaustion in relation to patents except for a few specific instances. Uh, and one of them is where prices are fixed by the state, and then they have national exhaustion of patents uh, to preserve uh, the market for pharmaceuticals. Um, I think that may well be something that is worth looking at um, by the government. Um, but what, of course, everybody uh, is uh, concerned about is really what is best uh, for us in this changing world and what is best for our health. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much.